So normally people always ask me, what, what are we doing? Students for Liber Liberty is a non-profit organization from students for students. And what our goal is, is to provide services for students. And what we're doing with that is like we're concentrating on giving out resources. Probably you have seen the book, The Morality of Capitalism, or a book from Bastiat, or Ayn Rand, and Mises. And we have all that free stuff. We will ship out to campus groups if they request that. We have free seminars in the internet, which you can check out. We have even archives where people like, I don't know, Tom Palmer, uh, Stefan Molyneux, some folks from, from our staff, um, Peter Bertke, speaking about different topics, environmentalism, economics, whatever, so that you can just really conveniently access from a computer at home and just check that out. The second, second thing what we are doing is training, stuff like that. We got trained like two months uh, in online through webinars, and then we have on-the-ground training as well. So what we want to do with that is to give the right tools to future leaders of campus groups, of activist groups, of political parties, or whatnot, uh, so that they can run their uh, organizations more efficiently. I said political groups because I'm not very specific on who I'm teaching, but our organization does not focus on politics. We are staying in the realm of ideas, and we want to talk about theory and all that good stuff. Of course, we talk about politics, but we will we'll never say, like, you have to vote on Paul or something like that. We are staying neutral in that regard, and that's very important to me. And the third pillar is networking. You see, that's a German three. <laughs> I cannot do that, that hurts my fingers. <laughs> and <clears throat> the third pillar is networking because you guys probably don't have the problem because you're all of you living in New Hampshire? I am. Yeah, okay, you don't have that problem. But normally, if you are on the training, scrum, training grounds for future socialists, which are called universities nowadays, then as a libertarian, you are often uh, very lonely and you cry a lot and you're desperate. So we want to give these uh, folks then like a forum where they can discuss and can say, look, uh, how it works right now, uh, democracy, that, that, that doesn't work at all. And this gives them a safe haven. Hi guys, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm uh, doing good. We're just starting so you didn't miss anything. Uh, yeah, that's what we're focusing on. And some, some rough estimates here we have now, this is like all, we have 700 campus groups all around the world. We started in Europe seven months ago doing our work. We had 20 campus groups, now we have 100. We had our first European Students for Liberty Conference with uh, 220 participants from 25 countries. Last week it was the international conference with 1,013 participants. So it's really growing and uh, it's a lot of fun. We have regional conferences and you should check that out because there's a lot of stuff going on here, especially in the US. Here's some pictures. That's a European one. We can dress nicely as well. <laughs> that's the international one from last year. The, the new picture I don't have right now. That's, for example, some free books you can request if you have a campus group and you just have like three minutes. You fill out a form. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do anything. You just say, give us free stuff and we will give us you guys free stuff. For example, yeah, the morality of capitalism, we have 100,000 of them. I think only 20,000 are left. So get that and we have the Bestiat books and a couple of others. So why is communication so important? Uh, just roughly our idea is that we have a theory of social change. We want to focus in on ideas because uh, some of us think that politics is only a short term solution, but if the idea is behind that, then it's not going to be long term. For example, you have seen Reagan, you have seen Thatcher. All these libertarians tried to change something, but then somebody else came into office and changed everything back, because the ideology behind that was not very prevalent in society. So our theory is to give the tools to future leaders, to train them, uh, to give them exposure to different kinds of libertarian ideas, so that they're becoming more professionally, and then giving something back to the organization or to libertarianism as a whole as academics, as leader and think tanks, as politicians, as business leaders. That's our long-term approach. And we need on, ever, on each pillar of that, if you're talking to alumni, if you're talking to student leaders, if you're talking to the student bodies, to whomever, we need efficient communication. And we, we don't have a problem because we have dedicated people everywhere, just look around you, but mostly they are lacking the tools how to facilitate their work in a better way. So, what is important about internal communication? I don't think I have to talk extensively about that because New Hampshire, you have like a great libertarian community. You know that this is important. It's not a contradiction. We are very individualistic and we use methodological individualism, of course, but we know that it's very important to have like other people helping us. Or if I was just listening to the talk uh, from this guy who's um, having this uh, photography is not a crime. 
and with all his friends, uh, he would have been like arrested much a couple of times more than that now, because it's it's very important to have people back you up. And this is now important. You need like three pillars why uh, how to make internal communication really workable. First of all, you have to determine responsibilities. You do not only have to have like a leader or then a uh, like what is it, a vice chairman. But you have to determine like really responsibilities. So, for instance, the leader is in charge of marketing. The leader is in charge of institutional outreach. The leader is in charge of, um, I don't know, talking to the to the campus leaders and stuff like that. And you really have to determine that. And in a second step, you have to say what do you want to achieve. You have to have goals, tangible goals. So, for instance, we want to become the biggest campus group on our campus within the next year. That's a tangible goal, you can measure your success. If you just say, okay, we are a campus group, we like libertarian ideas, you want to chat about that, there's nothing wrong with that. But you have to know first what you really want to do with your group, what are your goals, and if they are achievable, and to make them measurable. Because this is all like, we're doing it for free, we're doing it because of fun, uh, we do not get any income normally if you don't do fundraising, so it's hard for us to measure our success, but in the long term we want to do that. You have to uh, coordinate activities, which is uh, very, very important. So what we are doing in Students for Liberty is normally we are quite a virtual organization. People are spread out all over the world. And for instance, I'm in Spain, a uh, friend of mine, he's a permanent traveler. I have no idea where he is normally. And then we have people in the UK, people in some other countries. So there's some guidelines. And each Friday, for instance, we are Selecting, uh, I'm collecting all my things, what I've done throughout the week. Um, we are no normally obliged, quote unquote, to work like 15 hours on SFL stuff. So what I've done, I'm just having a short list on bullet points, what I've done throughout the week. Then I send this each Friday to, to one person, to Gabrielle in our organization, and she's collecting that and sending it out on Saturday. So we can really see, okay, Wolf has done nothing, uh, Fred has done this, that, that, that. And then you can follow up on people. So normally your responsibility is organizing seminars in the internet. What happened with that? And so you can call up people on uh, what is the progress. And if you see that some people are not doing then you can ask, okay, what's going on there? Are you fulfilling your task? Do you have problems? Do you need help? And then you can identify problems very click, uh, quickly as well. And this is just an easy tool where you do not have to meet in person. And if you facilitate that in that way, uh, it's really productive. So it, it works quite good. And a third point is sharing information. Uh, there's, there's something which is over communicating, but normally that doesn't happen. Uh, it's always better to just say, look guys, I'm, I'm working on this project now, I don't have time for my second responsibility. And, uh, and that's the reason why you have to cre create a community in the first place as well. Because if you're all friends at the beginning, and if you hang out, then you have a different kind of um, culture within your organization. So you can say, look, I have exams right now, I have to write this paper, I have to do this presentation, I have to do crazy libertarian stuff this weekend, I don't have what time whatsoever. And if you can say that to your friends and say, okay, that's cool, and you're helping each other out, then it works much more smoothly if you just have like a very strict hierarchy where people have to tell you what to do. Because you are in charge of your own responsibilities, of your own areas of ownership, we call that. So if you're successful, People see that you're successful and you will get the credit for it. Are you failing the other way around? And it can always be that you're taking over a project and you cannot handle that anymore. So for instance, I only have two responsibilities. Only doesn't mean that's, that that's only a few, but we do not want to load people too much responsibility. So for instance, I'm a regional director. I'm in charge of a very heterogeneous group of countries like Spain, Portugal, Germany, Austria, and German-speaking Switzerland. And the second uh, thing is I'm helping out in development. So I'm approaching donors, I'm writing emails and letters and this kind of stuff. If you don't have this ownership uh, areas and you have the tragedy of the comments, you don't know what are people doing. If you don't have the sharing of information, you don't know what's going on. Are the things which we want to achieve, are they being taken care of and this kind of stuff. And sharing information is very important if you have in the long term leadership transition as well because it could be you guys are dedicated, you're good libertarians, and you're, you're running your campus group or your, your activist group really, really efficiently, but then, if you don't take care about the leadership transition, it can all break down. We have seen so many efficient campus groups, which were really, really big, having like three or four events at the campus each semester. And then there was another guy came in, and he screwed it up. 
he didn't use the same tools we the, the first person did. He didn't know about all the context, what the last person has. Uh, he didn't know about how to deal with the bureaucracy and all this. So it's always good to have some kind of knowledge management. Uh, it sounds a little bit bureaucratic, but it's helpful. For instance, when um, they sent me out to an event. For instance, we went to an event in Austria. There was like a gala dinner, and it was called Austin Economics Gala Dinner and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we thought, oh, mm, that's good. A uh, couple of libertarians are going to be there. And we make a lot of contacts, so we gathered some information. But when we were there, Austrians are really, really bad with networking. So we're standing in the closed groups and we couldn't talk to them, so it was really hard to approach people like that. So we learned about that, we wrote in a report, and the next time the organization is organizing an event, we know about it. If you have then a leadership transition and students will not be students for a long time normally, especially in the States where you have to pay shit tons of money for your education. Uh, then they, will, then they will know that, and they know what you have to do. So what is your goal? So you're going to, to one event and you know what are your goals. You want to find people who donate to you. You want to find speakers. You want to get your organization out. And you can then measure that. Then we have some best practice stuff. Answer emails within 48 hours. If you can't, just let people know. This week I cannot do it, and then we know about it. Uh, do not hesitate to ask. So for instance, um, we had a problem. I didn't know where the books were, and I just asked, can you, can you tell me that? It's just easy to do, so don't be reluctant to that, even if you're not the chairman of the organization. And yeah, uh, even though we are quite virtual, and I don't know if this is um, applying to you guys, because it could be that you're meeting very often, in-person meetings are always better. If you see each other face-to-face, they're not like communication uh, misconceptions or something like that, that's always the best method. I will go a little bit faster through that because I'm, I'm guessing you are quite good with that and I don't have, I only have uh, half an hour, I guess. So the easiest thing is if you're doing a public event and if you're speaking, just Google uh, how to prepare a presentation. It's, I know people always say that, but for instance, I'm studying Austin Economics as I've told you, but we have a guy there, very professional, always suit and tie, he works at the Spanish Central Bank, funnily enough, but we always have guys there, so we're undermining <laughs> the institution. But very professional, very eloquent, but if he has a presentation, it's like font size minus three, and he copies the, like, the whole human action on the slide. <laughs> and people are just, oh, and they cannot read it anymore, so just, just uh, tell people how to prepare a presentation, Google that, and that's, that's okay. Speak freely. Uh, I know it's hard, but if you have some notes here, I, I never pay attention to them, I forget a lot of points, but I speak very, very freely, and normally I get the points across I want to get across. It's, of course, it's a little bit practice, but if you do that beforehand, and you have just a couple of friends, and you have an important presentation coming up, just do it once with them, and they can point out to you, look, you say like 100,000 times an M, you say like all the time, please stop doing that, that's annoying, I get distracted. And then you can learn from that, because you normally, if you do not see yourself talking, and hopefully I get this tape so I can analyze myself to get even better, and to get rid of my thick uh, German accent, <laughs> um, this will help me, and this will help my audience to understand me better. Because an important point is, if people don't get you, it is your fault. It's not their fault. If you're speaking about a topic which is very advanced, and you know your stuff, you wrote just your, your thesis about it, and you talk very elaborately in a lot of difficult terms in that, and the people don't understand you, then they are not stupid. You are stupid that you did not understand what your audience was looking for. <laughs> and this, this is hard to accept, but this is really the approach you have to take. Uh, be succinct. If you talk a lot and you make it very elaborate, some people are impressed by that, but if you do not communicate what you want to communicate, you fail as well. Take your time sometimes. That's my problem. I'm speaking way too fast, which is especially stupid because English is not my mother tongue, so I'm sometimes running into problems of the sentence structure. But I'm kind of aware of it, and I'm, I'm trying to uh, like push the brakes a little bit and sometimes take my time. So, for instance, if you just lose your train of thought, just look in your notes. If you just take like one, two, three, four, five seconds, your audience will not have a problem. Normally, they are thankful for you because if the listening is very exhausting. And if you just give them a little bit of time, then they can digest more what you have just have said. Be aware of your speaking habits. I know that I'm too fast, and I have a couple of M's. If you know that, then you can work on it. And we have, for instance, in our leadership handbook, no, not in a modern speaking handbook, we have the suggestion, I never tried that, but I, I, I think I want to do that at some point, that you can practice your speech in front of your friends, and each time you have one of these buzzwords, they shoot you in the face with a water gun. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's, it's very it's very harsh. It's very harsh. I don't know if it works, but uh, I've heard about a little bit less abrasive way to do that. It's just to flick the lights. Oh, you, you know, uh, you have somebody on the light switch, and every time uh, you say like or on the whatever word you want to point, it's just a flick of the lights, and it's I guess a little less <laughs> abrasive than a shoot. Okay, yeah, that, that's place, okay. That's, that works. That's, uh, it definitely works. <laughs> that sounds better. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of things. Who's your target group? So I'm. Speaking here formally, you have one hand in my pocket because I know you as students, uh, you're okay with that. But still, I'm, I'm acting professionally. I have a shirt on, I have a Mises tie, I hope you noticed. Um, <laughs> and this kind of stuff. But you have to adapt accordingly. So, for instance, if I would speak to a couple of socialists here, I would be much more careful and I would say, uh, when I'm talking about Wolfbart, I would explain who Wolfbart is and this kind of stuff. This is just common sense. Uh, which is very important as an elevator pitch. Uh, is it already on? No, it's not. The elevator pitch is very important. It means that you are able to do, uh, to present your organization in the best way possible within 30 seconds. So you get into an elevator, you, you meet somebody uh, who might be interested in donating to you. It's like a rich businessman, you know that he's libertarian or something. And you have to be able to say in 30 seconds, what is your organization to make him interested? So what are you guys doing? Uh, what is your goal? What are your successes? And stuff like that. This is an important tool which is really related to learn to how to work a room. This is like a little bit more professional, but if you want to get your organization out there, it's always good to have, to go to meetings like this. And if you want to meet other people like speakers here. I already made like a lot, couple of notes about speakers if they would come to our conferences. That's the easy thing. So I go there saying, hi, I'm, I'm Wolf, I'm from the Students for Liberty, and give them my card and ask them normally to give them your card, especially with students, they don't normally have cards. So what you can do normally is take out your business cards if you have one, or you should have like a little note or something like that, notepad, and then you write down their email addresses and you can come back to them within two days. So people still remember you, you follow up with them, and they're probably then on your newsletter list or they're getting more information about your organization. So I did that at the International Students Liberty Conference as well, made some good contact there, and two, li two days later I wrote like, look at that, you are so awesome what we are doing, uh, please support us. New media, uh, it really depends on, on your goals and how much you want to do that. If you have people who are good with cameras, with videos, with animations, go ahead, it's awesome. But if you don't have that, don't do it. Um, I think Facebook and Twitter, uh, it's fun, you have to have that, and a newsletter. But even though if you don't have people in Twitter, it's not that important if you have a small campus group. So it really depends on your desires and your needs for the organization. But you don't have to just be everywhere because you just want to present anywhere. So you have to have people who are behind that and doing it. For instance, we have like two people who are just running our Facebook group, posting propaganda there constantly. And since I'm doing that all the time anyway, I'm doing it. The last point is really important, especially uh, I'm quite reluctant to that because I don't know, I got brought up in a way that I do not want to annoy people, I try to be polite, and you can really not annoy people. For instance, uh, when I invited my classmates to our conference in Europe, there was a, all of them are anarchists or minarchists, an Austin economics program, and I posted it five times in a, in a closed Facebook group. And then I asked the guy, are you coming to our conference? What conference? He didn't know about it, so you can really, really spam a little bit, and we always saying for t if you, for one person you annoy with your message, 10 people will get your message. Mm. So if you have an event coming up, don't assume that you have one newsletter to your audience and everybody knows that. Write one day before. If it's an important event, call people up, call your people up and get them on. It's, it's, it's work, it's true. What happened there? But um, It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Because if you want a successful event, you cannot assume that people heard it and then you have just mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, propaganda. It doesn't work. All right, let's come to the most important point. I think this is like more my ideas and my experience because I did a lot of mistakes in the past. What can libertarians do better when communicating to other people, to themselves and stuff like that? to not win a discussion, but to have productive discussions and to learn from it as well. That's an important thing, you have to shift your focus. Because I used to be like a classical liberal and I got most of my opinions from media and from the party and stuff like that and I said, oh, minimum wage is bad. And then I learned about all these minimum wage studies and I cited them when I was talking to people, but that was not at all productive. So somebody was saying an argument against me and I already had like three or four arguments and then I said, but that's not a communication. 
you do not interact with a person. You're just trying to win the argument, which is not productive, because it could be that you are finding a socialist which showed you some theories in your flow of property rights. Uh, for example, the homesteading is a quite a fishy concept. And I've learned that through discussions with, with socialists, and this was productive, and I thanked him for that, or her, and uh, I've learned something from it. And if you're a pleasant person, then this reflects good on libertarianism as well. Know your definitions, which is very, very important. Normally, if you talk to socialists or something like that, or statists, you will break them down, not if you're talking on a very abstract level about healthcare and the benefits in this country and Cuba versus Germany and stuff like that. No, you get them already at their foundations. So if you know your definitions, uh, then it's always a, a good step because normally people don't ask for that. So they're talking, if you're using the term capitalism, it's clear for you. It means like free market, everybody's happy, voluntarism, yay. But if, if you talk to socialists, mm -hmm. they mean with capitalism, not normally that, or, but they mean corny capitalism, they mean the culture, they mean oppression. It means like there's a whole society. And if you're not clear about the definitions, then you cannot discuss because you're on totally different levels and you will not come to one point. And that is vice versa, so you have to ask for that. <laughs> if somebody says to you, I think the state is good <coughs> because uh, they will provide the best thing for society and we, we have agreed on a social contract. Sounds awesome, doesn't it? But what the heck does that mean? What social contract? I didn't sign shit. <laughs> what are you talking about? What is social utility? I can only have utility, but what is social utility? You cannot add up social utility. Okay, that's a little bit Austrian mindset right now. But if they're talking about this abstract concept, you, you just try to understand what the meaning of that. Probably they even have a good theory, which is less likely, but it might happen. So you should focus more on listening, just like only attacking them. Because normally then, if you're just using the Socratic method and asking them questions, so what do you mean with the welfare state? So what do you mean with solidarity? I'm all, all for solidarity, but is your definition of solidarity Stealing money from one person, give it to another person? Is this solidarity for you? Are you sure about that? And then people start to question that. And therefore you need the definition of the state. Because by definition the state is violence. But a lot of people don't know that. But if you give them a definition, which is a standard definition, government is, a, is an entity in a geographical area which is, it's also important to do this, legitimate uh, use of force, um, then they cannot argue against it. They probably say, oh, what is our public education? It's for free. How do they get their money? <laughs> and so on and so on. You can go, go through that and then they realize it. And then they might be careful, uh, more careful in the future. Yeah. Use methodological individualism. Uh, great term, sounds awesome, it's not that hard. That just means that you look at problems in general from the individual level and go up. Of course, you can use concepts like spontaneous order. Spontaneous order is a collectivist concept, but you do not forget the individual. A lot of people are interacting and then it's complicated, nobody knows anything anymore and suddenly, woo, you have law and all that. <laughs> Which is basically spontaneous order, breaking down in one sentence. I'm so high. <laughs> um, but if you use that, you can really analyze what people are saying. So this goes again to the definition. If you're saying, we Americans have to do that, what does it mean? Am I included in the we? I totally disagree with the we. Mm -hmm. And then you're already on, on a philosophical level where you can really analyze these things. Important point is, because you encounter a lot of these people doing that all the time, is that you have to establish points and recapitulate. So if you have argued against, for instance, public votes, and the person says, oh yeah, I'm not totally convinced, but I get your point. Uh, normally they don't say that, but you have to pin them down, say that if they're not that, normally they're framing the discussions, I call that. They're saying, oh, but what is about the poor? What is about the sick? What is about the elderly? Uh, and who builds the votes? Uh, you have to stop at some point and say, look, did you understand my argument? Was it clear to you? What is your problem with that? And if you then establish a point, you can move on. But if you don't do that, people always try to find that one question which you cannot answer. And if you could answer all questions in all situations, we would be monarchists and not anarchists, or like, uh, minarchists, because we don't think that one person alone knows all the knowledge to have the best society built up. But if people say to you, like, at home in attack, oh, Milton Friedman worked with Pinochet. Said, yeah, so what? What, 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 has that to, what has this to do with the theory? And if you know about this stuff, then you're less attackable. Or, democracy, we have that for 100 years, therefore it's good. Logical fallacy. Yeah. You can just point that out, but they're like more complicated ones, and you know about them, then first of all, you don't commit them, which is more honest. 
and which will be uh, lead to a more productive debate. And you can point other people out that they are uh, just fell into the term of a logical fallacy. Um, I think I'm out of time, but I would like, if you have to some questions, uh, at one point I would like to add, when you're discussing to somebody, and you're saying that you are libertarian, you are representing the ideology. So if you are getting aggressive, if you are impolite, then this reflects on libertarianism. And this is important to know. So it's always good to be just nice. And if people are even like not nice to you, just withdraw from the debate. This is another point I have. Freedom means always the freedom not to engage. So if you have an individual who's just like a troll and just asks questions but doesn't listen to you and you get some question, don't engage. Just say, yeah, thank you, I don't care. Get a beer, talk to somebody else. Um, this is important. And if you're getting angry, you should always analyze your feelings. So is it, is it legitimate that you're getting angry or is it probably that something triggered you? Because you had some bad experience with a person who was similar and you're just getting angry or you're not able to solve the argument but you, you direct your anger towards the person. If you can analyze that, uh, then you can just refrain from that and say you stay calm. But if the person's really attacking you or something, and you can, you can use your anger, for instance. But it always depends on the context. But you have to be aware of that, that sometimes our feelings are misleading us, or we interpret them wrongly. Okay, I think that's all time for what I have, but I would love to talk to you guys later on uh, if you want to. Thank you.